Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. We, as scientists, are not separate from our communities. Well, that's the surprise, usually, when you read and think something's false, and it's not. And it really is a community. It's nice. We really do care about each other. Today on Spotlight, what a Hall of Fame Cardinals baseball player has to do with the St. Louis Art Museum. Plus, symbols and secrets in a stolen painting inspire a novel. And then Dinah Roris is back at the St. Louis Zoo. Find out what's new this year for kids to learn and play. But first, pickleball is all the rage. Why the social aspect of the game makes it so popular. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. You might say these people are friends of the court and they're having a ball. Anybody who comes can play and we just have a good time. It's called pickleball, a fast growing sport a lot of people still know very little about. Though these days it's hard to miss. Pickleball is played all over town. These folks meet several days a week at North Point Park in Baldwin. I'd say the number of players has probably doubled or tripled since the pandemic started. Pickleball has been around since the 1960s and is a cross between tennis, ping pong, and badminton. Nothing about the game has anything to do with pickles, but the exact origin of its goofy name is in dispute, even amongst members of the families who invented it. There are two different stories. One is that they used to have a dog by the name of Pickles, and when the ball got away, they'd send the dog and they'd say, Pickle ball, and he'd go get it. The wife of the guy that invented the game said, that's not really true, but I like the story. <laughs> Part of the draw of pickleball is how quickly you can start playing. It's easy to learn and inexpensive to get started. An entry-level paddle costs less than a single round of golf. And in pickleball, you don't have to be a great athlete to have a great time. If you watch the people, some of them run, some of them don't. <laughs> you know, it's not a big deal. They call me the statue. <laughs> because because uh, movement to me is laborious, okay? So I, I kind of stand still, and if I can't get it, it's a nice shot. <laughs> I'm almost 80. My name is Parkinson's disease. And I play as much as I can, it's just not very fun. But I play. Whether it's the welcoming atmosphere or ease of play, pickleball's popularity continues to grow. Since 2014, participation in the United States has doubled. And while the sport has a reputation as a game for older people, almost one third of those playing these days are under the age of 25. I can come here. I don't need to arrange with three other people to play any time. I just come here, show up, I play with here, play as long as I want, and I leave. You know, it's just completely open play. People walk by and they say, can you play here? We say, yeah, yeah we got an extra paddle. We have a paddle and they play. Four zero. Pickleball seems by design to be as much a social activity as an athletic one. Both on the court, where opposing players stand just 14 feet apart, and on the sidelines, where players waiting to swap in swap stories. What happened last night? Hey, did you see the cards last night? Hey, did you see the blues last night? Oh, you haven't been here for three days. What's the problem? Oh, grandkids were in. Where'd you go? It's not just the weather. We had two courts for a long time. So we'd have eight playing and 12 sitting out. And it was a nice social time. People sat around and talked. Now we repainted this about three weeks ago to four courts. Now people complain they don't get to sit out and talk enough. <laughs> To me, it's changed my life because I did it right before COVID. And during COVID, we played out here all winter. We had gloves and hats and, you know, we'd bring the shovels if we needed to. And it really is a community. It's nice. We really do care about each other. Betty Vint learned just how deep that feeling goes when in August of 2021, her husband, Stephen, passed away after a long illness. Pickleball helped me to relieve my stress while I was going back and forth to the hospital. The day that my husband passed, my pickleball family was right at my door the day that he passed to support me. Three, one, two. 
Some locations attract more competitive players, but the vast majority of pickleballers are just doing it for the smile. Sure, they often have to spend time explaining pickleball to people who've never heard of it, but the camaraderie they feel and the sense of community they enjoy make playing pickleball a net gain. The people are so nice and accepting and encouraging. It's just a, a great way to spend the, the morning. Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. We are in the exhibition Catching the Moment, contemporary art from the collection of Ted L. and Marianne Ellison Simmons at the St. Louis Art Museum. Ted Simmons is a Hall of Fame baseball player. He played with the St. Louis Cardinals from 1967 to 1980. Marianne Ellison Simmons is an artist and a printer, and the Simmons collection adds considerable breadth and depth to the St. Louis Art Museum's collection. There are 45 artists represented in the collection, so it adds in numbers, but it also adds in the types of artworks that are represented. So many of the artists were very socially and politically motivated in their artwork, so that builds on an area that the museum's collection was not so strong in before. There are also a number of LGBTQ artists, a number of women artists, there are African American, Native American, Latin American artists. It really builds the collection in a number of ways in terms of identity and also in the types of subjects that are represented. With the acquisition of this collection, we acquired 25 new artists. There's 43 artists in the collection total, and 25 of those were not previously represented in our collection. And three of the most important are Kiki Smith, Enrique Chagoya, and Tom Huck. So Kiki Smith is a contemporary artist who works in a wide variety of media. So she's a printmaker, she's a sculptor, she works in installation, and we have a variety of media by her. And Enrique Chagoya is a Mexican-American artist who is primarily a printmaker and appropriates from popular culture and historical references, kind of satirizes colonialism and makes statements about the continued colonialism of people around the world. And then Tom Huck is a St. Louis printmaker. He's really a master of woodcut. And what's very exciting about this exhibition is we include some of his blocks as well as the prints to help people understand the process of printmaking. So along with my two co-curators, Andrea Ferber and Elizabeth Wyckoff, we actually looked at almost every work in the collection while attempting to decide what would get narrowed down and included. And we wanted to focus both on the things that made this collection special. So for example, artists that were held in particular depth and then also on some of the themes that emerged to us as we were looking through the works. So many of the artists included in this collection look to contemporary popular culture and media as inspiration for the works that they are producing. And so that ranges from things like comic book characters like Captain America and Superman, and whether they're sort of celebrating or poking fun or changing our perceptions of what might be very familiar sources of imagery. SLAM is what is often referred to as an encyclopedic museum, which is a bit of a complicated idea, but essentially means that we collect art from all over the world and all time periods. And this collection, through connections that artists are making to other cultures and other time periods, allows us to really think productively about how looking at moments today can help us understand and connect to and expand on the past and then build a different and hopefully better future. The museum has published a catalog in conjunction with this exhibition. There are images of 104 of the 193 works that are in the exhibition. The three co-curators of the exhibition, myself, Andrea Ferber and Claire Cobesa, and then also our colleague Sophie Barbazon, who's the associate paper conservator, have each written essays which go into different aspects of the works in the collection. There's also a wonderfully engaging interview with Marianne Ellison Simmons and Ted Simmons of them talking about their collecting contemporary art. So Catching the Moment is on view at the St. Louis Art Museum until September 11th. To learn more, you can visit the museum's website, slam.org. With every stroke of the bow, every stroke of the brush, with every stroke of genius, the arts make life in St. Louis richer, not just emotionally, but also economically. In our region, the arts create almost $600 million a year in economic activity, supporting more than 19,000 jobs, 
generating almost $60 million for state and local governments, with almost 12 million annual arts-related visits. That's more than all St. Louis sporting events combined. Whether in a park, on a street, or a wall, experimental or a classic, the arts deserve our support because the arts help support us. HEC Media is proud to be our region's home for arts, education, and culture. Because in St. Louis, the arts mean business. The Ghent Altarpiece. If it could talk, it would have quite the story to tell. It's about the most violated, destroyed, and stolen work of art in history. Since 1432, 13 times it has been, something has happened to it. That, plus all the tiny symbols and secrets hidden in this 12-panel masterpiece, had the thriller writer's brain going ever since he visited it almost a decade ago. I've been wanting to use the altarpiece in a novel for a long time, and I couldn't figure it out. As it turns out, Steve Barry just needed a different investigator to take on the altarpiece's secrets. And many of his past New York Times bestsellers, readers followed retired operative Cotton Malone on dangerous missions. But in The Omega Factor, it's newcomer Nicholas Lee who travels to Belgium and stumbles onto a historic and shocking mystery involving the altarpiece, an order of nuns, and the Catholic Church. So tell me, you've changed publishers, and because of that, kind of flip things around for you. You are all set for a Cotton Malone, and he's on vacation, and Nick Lee came in. I'd written the Cotton Malone book for, that was finished. It was ready, done, ready to turn it in. And then I got an opportunity to, to move to another house. And it wasn't something I planned on. It's just something kind of happened. Yeah. And when I did, uh, they had an idea. Let's, let's don't start with Cotton. Let's start with something different, mm -hmm. same but different. Let's put it that way. So they wanted action, history, secrets, conspiracies, which is the same, okay. but they wanted a new character. And luckily, in my brain, I had to him. He was, he's been up here for about 10 years. You're known for going and really delving into an area, and that becomes a character almost in your book. Yes. So you'd already done this I'd already research. Done, I'd already done all that, yeah. We'd also gone to Ghent, and we had seen the altarpiece. John Van Eck was a, a miniaturist. He could paint very small. And there's so many symbolisms and secrets yeah. in the thing. What do they mean? I don't know. Nobody knows, to be honest with you. And that was, that's perfect for me because now I can do what I want with it. And I created my own little secret that is real. I based it on, I didn't make up anything. I didn't add anything to the, to the painting. I used exactly what was in the painting to create my own little secret. But here's the, here's the thing now. They've been restoring the panels and they're done now. But the center panel was in restoration a, a couple of years ago when I was writing the book. There's a website you go to called Closer to Van Eck and it has all the panels on ultra high resolution. You can see the creases. You can see the, the dust in the creases of it. That's how far down you can get. Well, I found this house that Van Eck had painted in the center panel, top left portion, back in the trees, it's very small. You have to be under ultra high resolution to find it. There it is. I said, that's great. And sure enough, it, it just worked perfect. I said, that's amusing. So I used it. When they did the restoration on the center panel, they painted over it. It's gone. It's not there anymore. Mm -hmm. That's really weird. Why? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. What Now, was it added later and they decided to get rid of it? But it's so small. Why not just leave it? You know, it's not not hurting anything. It's just so you can't even see it unless you're under there. So, but it's gone. It's not there anymore, which is fascinating. I read that ninety percent of your books are based on history, mm -hmm. and and in the back you talk about all the things that are real, which mm -hmm. is fascinating because you when you're reading it you think there's no way that that could be, and it so many times is that's the, that's the surprise usually when you read and think something's false and it's not because I keep it as close to reality as I can I have to trip it up a little bit because it's a novel and entertaining but I try to keep that to a minimum I really do to find out why he dedicated his book to Roy and Walt Disney watch the full interview at hecmedia.org scientists study local bees later on spotlight
We're in the Dinororus exhibit at the St. Louis Zoo. It's an immersive type exhibit for kids and adults to learn about dinosaurs, their history, some fun facts, interact with them, and learn about how you can save our current dinosaurs, the birds, and other wildlife. So this is the second year for Dinororus, and some people may think, well, I saw it last year. What is there different this year? There are a number of things different. We have a whole new dino dig area for the kids and the adults to participate in. So more digging options to uncover fossils. As well as that, we have a few new animals too. So with the dinosaur dig area, we have a crow. And the reason we have a crow is because the coloration of the crow is the same as you would see in a microraptor, if there was still a microraptor around. We have macaws on exhibit now, and the beaks of the macaws are similar to beaks which dinosaurs had. And also we have free roaming guinea fowl. We do have a few other species here too. Three of our exhibits are actually in our gift shop area. Those are our aquatic exhibits, our marine tanks with jellyfish, corals, sponges, and fish. And we also wanted to emphasize that a lot of the animals which are around even before the dinosaurs are still with us. But now even those are disappearing. So when you come here, make sure you go inside, learn a little bit more about some of the other species which are around before and after the time of the dinosaurs. So we have some returning favorites. Uh, right behind me is Delophosaurus, which is uh, one of our two spitting dinosaurs here. Uh, most people may recognize Delophosaurus from Jurassic Park, but Jurassic Park really kind of got everything wrong. It is much bigger, it doesn't spit venom, but ours spits water. Uh, T-Rex, of course, always a fan favorite. Tyrannosaurus rex is here, over 12 feet tall. It really gets people excited. It's a great photo op too. And other species like Parasaurolophus with the long crest. This is one of what was used to be called the duckbill dinosaurs. But we also do have one new additional dinosaur this year, which is Euoplocephalus, which is in the dino dig area. It's a type of ankylosaur. And for the adults who are listening, if they don't know what an ankylosaur is, ask your kids. So people wonder why we have this exhibit for a second year. It's because first off, it was incredibly popular. Uh, kids love dinosaurs, adults love dinosaurs. So that was one aspect. But additionally, it has a number of stories which people don't tend to think about. Most dinosaurs, the non-avian dinosaurs, the, the non-birds are extinct, but we want to educate people on why they became extinct. And unfortunately, a lot of the things that we're doing today to wildlife around the world are the same things which happened to the dinosaurs. You know, loss of habitats, increased temperatures. So we want to educate people that what has happened in the past is also going on now. But we also want to give a hopeful message on what you can do. And there's a lot of things we tell people about what they can do to help our modern day dinosaurs and all the other animals on the planet, planting native plants, learning more about extinction, learning more about wildlife, and supporting organizations like the St. Louis Zoo. Dinororus is here through October 31st. Also, if you want to learn more about the conservation efforts of the St. Louis Zoo, you can visit the zoo's website at www.stlzoo.org. Is your child fascinated by dinosaurs? Let them learn more at our educational website, educate.today. Use keyword dinosaurs. Looking for videos to use in homeschool, classroom, or hybrid learning settings? Need them aligned to standards, lesson plans, or activity ideas? We've got them at educate.today. Mark your calendars for the 2022 St. Louis Art Fair, taking place September 9th through the 11th. Go behind the art with HEC Media's Meet the Artist series at youtube.com slash meet the artist. Hi, my name is Betsy Best. I am an artist printmaker. I do relief printmakings, lino cuts and wood cuts. And in my work, I explore uh, line, composition, pattern and color. I had a background in graphic arts, so I think that sort of influences my work on some level. I'm extremely interested in pattern, just exploring different patterns, putting them together. I call it power clashing. I love playing with those sorts of elements in my work. And I sort of combine a little bit of Eastern and Western. I did a residency in Japan with woodcut and some of the techniques that I learned there, I actually use in my lino cuts now. Relief printmaking is very basic printmaking. You have a surface, a matrix, linoleum or wood, and you're carving away the areas that you don't want to print. 
I keep a lot of sketchbooks and from those images I draw, I combine images to make a composition. I transfer that onto a piece of linoleum or a piece of wood. And, um, and then I carve away the areas that I don't want to print. And those raised areas then receive the ink. I typically use several blocks. I have a key block that has kind of the structure of the image. And then I have subsequent blocks where I will print the color. And oftentimes I'll reduce that. So I'll print a color in an area, carve away some more, and then print that same area again in a different color. So I can create layers of color. I think the use of color goes along with sort of like the graphic quality of my work. You know, it's like I use a lot of black. I like bold lines. I like patterns. And so I try to use color, I guess, to balance out that boldness, soften it maybe. I'm thrilled to come to the St. Louis Art Fair and I do hope people come out and see my work and say hi. I love talking about my work. I love answering questions and I love meeting new people. My name is Radim Schreiber and I'm the firefly photographer, which means I specialize in photographing fireflies. I have been photographer for 20 years, but for the last six years, I have been full-time firefly photographer. And photographing fireflies is only possible because of the latest low light camera technology. This wouldn't be possible with film cameras. It is extremely difficult to photograph fireflies because they are so dim and this all happens at night. So I use two different techniques to photograph fireflies. One technique is for the close-ups. I go down in the grass and I press the shutter right in the moment as the firefly lights up. In that split of a second, I capture that beautiful light. When it comes to landscapes, when the fireflies are in the field or in the woods, I use a different technique. I leave the camera shutter open for many seconds or sometimes even minutes. And during that time, the camera accumulates light from the landscape, which is steady. But also every time Firefly blinks, it leaves a little light, little dot, a little dash, and that gets recorded. And the longer I leave the camera open, the more dots from the Fireflies gets recorded in the picture. When I was in college, I got really interested in photographing insects and my BFA show was insect photography, large macro photographs. One day when I was photographing for this project, I thought of a beautiful picture. And the picture was of a firefly on a blade of grass, illuminated with the moon in the background and kind of a blue colors. And that was the picture that was stuck in my mind for many years until I tried it in my garden many years later when the camera technology got ready and got better and I realized I can do it. Next summer, I spent photographing fireflies every single day, even on my birthday. And then I had a gallery show and one of the photographs has won the Smithsonian Photography Contest, first prize in nature category. And perhaps this was one of the things that propelled me in wanting to photograph fireflies even more and share them with others. I'm super excited to see all the people at the St. Louis Art Fair. I just cannot wait to be back and see the people and looking forward to share with them the light of fireflies. This story is brought to you in partnership with STL Made. St. Louis is a great, great place to come and study pollinators and pollination. We, we have an incredible team that happened to occur in, in this environment, in this city. There's a lot of folks here who study pollination biology, um, and you don't necessarily have that in other cities. We have um, collaborators as well with the Missouri Botanical Garden and the St. Louis Zoo, who are also very important in terms of conservation and bringing that angle to the project. I'm a professor of biology at St. Louis University. My main research focuses on the diversity 
and ecology of insect pollinators in urban environments. I work at Webster University and I'm one of the PIs on the program. We have actually seven of us from a whole bunch of different institutions in the city, um, which has been a blast to work with all these different people. My role is completing all of the behavioral parts. How are the bees and flies behaving on the flowers and how might that be contributing to pollination? We as scientists are not separate from our communities, not just bee communities, but people, human communities. What we're trying to do is understand what decisions we as humans make and how that influences the bees that are found in a, in a garden or in an orchard and then what that means for the reproductive success. Urban orchards are growing and in St. Louis we're up to over 50 of them thanks to Seed St. Louis and Dean Gunderson. But one aspect of those urban orchards because they tend to be so small is that the fruit production is great some years and poor other years. And we're really looking at ways of making that better. How are we gonna maximize this fruit production? Seed St. Louis basically works to help people that wanna grow their own food. So we work with about 250 different community groups right now uh, around the St. Louis region that are growing their own food for some sort of community benefit. We really have to look at both the pollinators and the plants and the surrounding area. We're interested in the pollinators because St. Louis has a huge diversity of bees, which is something that Gerardo Camillo has been working on for years, and putting that into a socioeconomic framework of what the land around is uh, doing for those bees. We have experts and people that are tending to each single step of the entire pollination process, all the way from the emergence of a flower bud to the moment that you pick that apple or, or that fruit from the tree. So it's really exciting to be able to, to take all these different sites to be able to pull data together um, and then hopefully to be able to take that data to then improve and reinforce the education that we're doing out to the full network of 250 groups to help them improve what they're already doing. So if we can find really simple ways that volunteer-run community gardens can implement that can provide a greater fruit production, then that's a huge win. Next week, a nonprofit helping women change careers or grow in their current one. Plus, part two of the Hive Mind Story, how bees improve urban orchards and community gardens. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.